There are two dilemmas that rattle the human skull. How do you hold on to someone who won't stay? And how do you get rid of someone who won't go? From Pod 617 Productions, it's Shine On, a presentation of Berkman, Botker, Newman, and Shine. Now here's your host, attorney Evan Shine. Episode number 21 of the Shine On podcast. I'm Evan Shine, the man, the myth, the legend. Producer David Yaz is with us. How are you, my friend? All three. All three in one person, man, myth, and legend. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm I'm doing well. David, I am excited for today's episode, and I can't wait to talk with our amazing guest, New York Times bestselling author of the book, Conscious Uncoupling, Catherine Woodward Thomas. When you think about divorce, what are the words that come to mind? Loss, devastation, grief, hopeless, powerless, rock bottom. What if divorce meant something else? What if it had a different meaning, a different word, association? If hopeless was replaced with healthy, if loss was replaced with looking ahead, if powerless was replaced with positive. After today's episode, the way you think about divorce will change. Can you divorce in a healthy way? Our featured guest on today's episode is here to tell you the answer. Yes, you can. Coming up on the other side of this week's docket is my interview with New York Times bestselling author of the book, Conscious Uncoupling, Catherine Woodward Thomas. She is our featured guest this week on episode number 21. This is an interview you're not going to want to miss. The docket is ready to go. Counselor, are you ready? Dave, let's do it. All right. And now, let's see what's on the docket. First on the docket, Evan, comes from our friends at the Wall Street Journal. Headline of the article reads, The pandemic made our relationships stronger. Despite early fears of a divorce surge, new data shows that after a difficult year, couples are more appreciative and committed. And it cites to a survey that finds, I guess kind of counterintuitively, for those whose relationships already had some cracks, the pandemic deepened the problems. But for those who had strong relationships with responsive partners, they felt more connected to their partner and reported better relationship quality. Your thoughts? Dave, look, over the past 18 months, we have seen article after article with a different take. Some say the divorce rates are surging. Others say the divorce rates are lower. The pandemic stress is impacting relationships. Pandemic, look, it's forced us to communicate. Some people are saying people are discovering a new appreciation with the time they're spending together. Great article with some interesting statistics, but we don't know the true impact at least not yet. Mm -hmm. However, we do have the Shine On podcast crystal ball that I took out (laughs) specially for today's episode. Oh, good. And I'm sitting here, I'm holding it, I'm giving it a a good shake, looking deep into it to find the answer, and it's coming to me. Give me a sec. (laughs) Dave, I'm predicting that one year from now, things, they're going to look a little bit different. The pandemic appreciation will wear thin, Old routines, pre-pandemic lifestyles will resume and return. And you're going to see the spike in 2022 that we've talked about before on the Shine On podcast episode. Change is never easy. And I think come the fall 2021, 2022, you're going to see things back to how they were before March of 2020. Yeah, that's shrewd, I think, Evan. And I agree with you now that I hear you say it out loud because someone that's divorced myself, it's it's not a decision you make precipitously. It's not one you, you make, in the, most people anyway, in the heat of the moment. You begin to mull it and you ponder it and you talk yourself out of it. You talk yourself back. And it can take years. And so I'm, I'm with you on that. I, I like the crystal balls prediction. And, and here's <laughs> the other part of it. People like routines. People like having the other person home and, and, and sharing responsibilities or doing things in a different way. But that's not forever. That's not going to be in place when, when things are open back up and people are back in the office and people are, are living their lives before things are going to change. So it's a good thing. We took out the Shana podcast crystal ball for today's episode. <laughs> it is. It is. We move to item number two on the docket from Psy Post. That's a PSYpost.org. 
Article reads, divorced parents are more likely to be highly disengaged or highly controlling, a study finds. According to a study of uh, 681 adolescents out of Beijing, divorced parents show a greater propensity for highly disengaged or particularly harsh parenting styles, which can have important consequences for their children, especially as it relates to feelings of loneliness. Your thoughts on this study, Evan? Dave, look, the points brought up in this article, I definitely want to ask a psychologist, a psychiatrist about someone with an expertise different from mine. However, from a divorce litigation context, what's interesting to me is that judges often appoint forensic psychologists to evaluate the family, conduct interviews, speak with collateral sources, and to ultimately issue a written forensic evaluation report. One of the components of a report is focused on the parenting styles and the impact of those parenting styles on the children. And ultimately, how does these how do these factors come into play during the evaluator's recommendations and conclusions? And the standard in New York when custody is unresolved is what is in the best interest of the child? And so with this standard in mind, and again, I have two evaluation reports on my desk ready for me to read and go through, I'm going to pay specific attention to the parenting styles of the parents and how that may or may have not impacted the evaluator's recommendations. Our featured guest this week on the Shine On podcast is Catherine Woodward Thomas. Catherine is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Conscious Uncoupling, Five Steps to Living Happily Even After, and the national bestseller, Calling in the One, Seven Weeks to Attract the Love of Your Life, which has a new an updated edition just out this year. Catherine is a marriage and family therapist and a relationship expert. Catherine and her work and books, they've been featured on the Today Show as well as the New York Times, Time Magazine, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the London Times, People Magazine, Women's Health, and many other media outlets throughout the world. Catherine is nice enough to join us. I appreciate the time. How are you? I'm really well. I'm glad to be here with you, too. Thank you for having me. Catherine, I want to start with the topic, breaking up in a healthy way. And let's get right into your absolutely terrific book, a bestseller, Conscious Uncoupling. What is Conscious Uncoupling? You know, Conscious Uncoupling kind of shot into the lexicon when Gwyneth and Chris used my term to announce their divorce. And I think that that was great in terms of visibility and introducing a new idea about how we might actually break up better. And I also think it came with a lot of giggles about Gwyneth, who's an endless entertainment with Gwyneth. But I also think that it gave people a somewhat maybe unrealistic perspective on conscious uncoupling, that it's kind of for the beautiful people who are probably going to break up well anyway. And I don't think it really describes that conscious uncoupling is actually for the person whose heart is broken and who feels crushed and who is normally a really lovely, good citizen who does the right thing for the right reasons as often as they can and suddenly wants to put bleach all over his best suits. <laughs> have so much rage <laughs> and what to do with that anger. So Conscious Uncoupling is a five-step program that really allows people to go through a, a breakup in a way that is reflective of their own moral, of their desire to not hurt themselves or anyone else, or certainly not do damage to their kids, who would like to be open to love in the future and not be carrying around baggage or feeling resentful for a year, five years, 10 years. I've met people 35 years later are still ruminating about what they didn't get that they should have gotten. So it just kind of puts it to, to bed. It, it, it allows you to integrate that deep disappointment in a way that leaves your heart at peace and light and kind of integrates the learning from that experience in a way that leaves you more capable of love on the other side. So on a very basic level, conscious uncoupling is a break that is kind of characterized by respect and 
by fairness and uh, striving to do the right thing for the right reasons. And it leaves everybody whole and well on the other side of that breakup and pretty set up to win in life, which is as not how most breakups go. I think that we're hardwired uh, for fairness, but I also think we're hardwired to stay together. And so when we break up, all heck breaks loose. Can I say hell? <laughs> all hell of breaks course. loose. No, I, okay, I, I, it's I, a absolutely. podcast. It's yeah. not primetime TV. Okay. So all hell breaks loose and, and we it brings out the worst in the best of us truthfully so it's it's how to how to normalize that to see that is normal to understand what's happening in your biology and in your brain we're not really built to break up we're built to bond and so our our nervous systems go into fight or flight we go to war that's normal we go from soulmate to soul hate pretty quickly and I think that's nature's trick to even keep us bonded to that person because as we all know, hate is not the opposite of love because hate is a high level of engagement. And You're Catherine, thinking you, about that person all the time. And, and you mentioned so, so many incredibly important things and in, in, there's a lot to unpack and you use the phrase soulmate to soul hate. And so I want to ask you, people who are breaking up and going through a separation and let's take the instance where it's a high conflict a highly emotionally charged relationship, separation, divorce. How do people in that dynamic go through the steps that you describe in your book, Conscious Uncoupling? Yeah, well, you have to start where you are. And, and usually, usually the person being left is in a different place with the person who's leaving. Because the person who's leaving has been thinking about this for a while. Now, their big emotions might be guilt, right? They might feel, you know, overwhelmed by by just guilt, but they've been dealing with the grief of that loss for a while, and they've been creating a new identity outside the relationship. So part of the devastation and what feels like a death to the person who's being left is, is the insult to one's identity, That this was someone who loved you and you had a sense of I'm so-and-so's partner and that gives me value in life. It gives me a place in the life. And so kind of the, the almost, we have very violent images that come to our mind because it feels violent. So the the image of that, that identity is murdered. Someone's killing that identity off. So it's a very, it can be very shocking to the person who's being left and they feel betrayed. They feel sideswiped. They feel that someone's been dishonest with them. How have you been planning this for a while? And I didn't know about this. So what happens is that the body is flooded with the feelings of my life is in danger. I'm being threatened at this very primal level. And that rejection, actually, it lights up the same parts of the brain as a primal threat does. So we're really in pretty primal territory. So we have to start there. And you have these big emotions. And the game is, how do I have the emotions, but the emotions don't have me? Because at the same time that's happening, Evan, you're usually faced with these really important decisions. Where do the kids live? How do we tell the children? What are we doing with our finances? Are we selling the house? Who gets to live in the house? So all of these very kind of important decisions are being made just at the time that someone is having all of these big emotions. So that's where we go into that phenomenon of moving from a positive bond to a negative bond. And we can make very, very bad decisions where we're holding someone hostage, where we're making sure that they pay for what they've done. And we're setting up structures that are really kind of the opposite of life affirming. They're they're almost an imprisonment. And I think a lot of damage has been done. And I I see it, I talk about in the in the book, I I have this image of karma and I, I unpack the original Latin interpretation of karma, which is that basically that every action we take is like planting a seed in our garden. And then we eat from those fruits in our garden. 
for and so if you're planting these bitter seeds in your garden you have to remember you are the one and your children if you have them are going to be eating those bitter fruits for many many years to come so what we want to do is kind of intercede and intercept that process of planting those bitter seeds in your garden and so we want to take a breath and i teach people techniques uh, about how to hold those emotions from a deeper center and even use the the intensity of their negativity to to fuel positive change in your own life so for example if you're angry it's usually for a very good reason that you feel that your rights have been violated your fundamental right to have somebody treat you with dignity or honor or to be honest with you so it might be that you you really reclaim your right to be someone who's treated fairly. And then you pledge yourself that from this moment forward, you're never going to dim down or skip over the red flags. You're not going to settle for less. You are going to learn the skills of healthy relating so that you from this moment forward will always know that you are being treated honorably in your relationships. So you're kind of using the intensity of the anger and you're pointing it in the right direction because what anger is truthfully is the energy of change. And most of us don't know how to use it productively. So it ends up being really, you know, counterproductive and really negative. So we have to, so you're, you're, you're learning how to set an intention for a better future. Catherine, I, I see that in my practice all the time that I see great people at, their absolute worst and at one of the lowest points in their lives, going through a breakup, going through a separation, where there's that feeling of, I want revenge. I want to get back at the person who caused tremendous heartache and pain and suffering. And I find that people unfortunately lose focus, or it's easy for people to lose focus if they're not guided back and if they're not able to really see the big picture, especially when children are involved. And so I want to ask you, what makes it so hard about a breakup for that, that unfortunately brings out the worst in people from an emotional standpoint and anger? Standpoint? Yeah, it's, I really appreciate what you're saying so much. And it's very hard, even I think on attorneys who want to support people to do this well to kind of talk someone off the ledge. And I think of conscious uncoupling almost as when you take kids to the bowling alley, they put those little bumpers up so it can't go in the gutter. That's how conscious <laughs> uncoupling is. It just kind of keeps the ball moving in the right direction. Well, I'll tell you what, that without the bumpers, but my daughter, uh, yeah, no, my daughter is thankful for those bumpers. So, <laughs> so um, I think it's, I think, first of all, we have to normalize those emotions. It's almost like if you think of humanity a thousand years ago, if someone wandered away from their tribe, it was pretty, it was a death sentence. Like it was pretty certain that they weren't going to make it. And we still have that same reaction in our body. We feel like our lives are being threatened. We are going to die. And I think that we're also really hardwired for fairness. And so when somebody behaves badly, which, oh, by the way, most people do at the end of love, it's an unfortunate fact. There's things to be angry about. So how do we how do we make sense of that rage? How do we deal with that rage in a way that is productive and that's not so much pointed at the other person? So the five steps of conscious uncoupling, they kind of move us through the, the, the stages that we need to get go through in order to get to the other side, kind of untethered to that person, just liberated and free. So the second step of conscious uncoupling, I think addresses uh, your question is one of the things that I have found that is the most liberating is to help people to really see their own part in something in a way that gives them the, the hope that they could grow beyond this so that they'll never do this again. And it kind of takes the focus off the other person. So there's a few things that we're up against when we do this. Number one it's hard to take your focus off the other person when they have behaved badly. They've cheated on you. They have a second bank account. They have done something pretty egregious that warrants anger. But I always like to say, if, if it's not, even if it's 97% the other person, you want to be really interested in your 3%. 
And that 3% usually is more subtle. It looks like I, I skipped over the red flags. I, 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 I didn't ask for what I really needed in this relationship. I settled for less or I chose this person because I thought they were going to somehow take care of me for the rest of my life. And then I underfunctioned and I just kind of rested in them taking care of everything. But I became like a teenager in the relationship. So you have to look at those things and you really have to see that clearly because otherwise on some level, you'll never really get over it because you'll somehow, as long as you're victimized, you're not taking responsibility for your part in a way that would allow you to grow through that experience, become a better person, become a more mature person and know that the relationships that you're going to create from this moment forward are much healthier or much happier. And so, so you have to make that transition. And the key is non-victimization. The other thing that's against us in this way is that if you've been left, it's a very severe trauma. And Judith Herman, who wrote, she was at Harvard, and she wrote a wonderful book that's kind of the ultimate textbook on trauma and recovery. She calls uh, breakups one of our most under, underrated traumas ever. So we understand that if somebody passes, that we all have to give our friends at least a year to kind of put themselves back together again, to be able to breathe fully again. But when it comes to a breakup, after six weeks of listening to our friends, maybe two, three months, we're like, okay, get over it again. Just get out there. Come out with me Friday night to the bar. Pick somebody up. Get over it already. We get impatient with people. But it's actually quite a big trauma for, for many people. And it's a trauma that people may not get over for years unless they consciously move themselves forward. And I have found that the thing that liberates us the most from that kind of where you're going over and over and you're ruminating and you're trying to put the pieces together. But if you're doing that from a victimized perspective, it it really doesn't ever get much better. That's where, well, time will make it better. Well, time will take the acuteness of the pain away, but it might not take the rejection sensitivity away or the high levels of defensiveness or the punishing the next person who tries to get close to you or the ruminating over what are they doing now on social media. That that stage can last for a long time. So to move ourselves beyond it really is step two, which has to do with the reclamation of our power. And that's always about owning your part clearly, seeing it very clearly and not blaming yourself. So seeing it as specific choices that you made that were kind of unwholesome, that were compensations from old wounds from childhood, that were ways to try and create safety that did exactly the opposite, like codependent behavior where you're chronically self-abandoning and disappearing yourself until there's no you left to love and then it's easy for the other person to leave so there's all sorts of subtle opportunities for graduation from core patterns that you've had in relationships for years that have not really been working anyway and this is kind of the crash and burn of them so it's a blessing in disguise it can be the best thing that ever happened to you step three then of course we're going into well what are the deeper beliefs now that would cause you to behave that way And that's break the pattern, heal your heart. And that tends to be like what I call going back to your source fracture story, the original wounding, which had to do with your narcissistic mother or your rageaholic father that caused you to do things like with your narcissistic mother, maybe overcompensate, overgive all the time because you internalize that as an I'm not enough story or with your rageaholic father and I'm not safe story. So your compensation was to make yourself invisible. So you never presence yourself. You never presence your feelings and needs. This is the core consciousness that set that relationship up to play out the way that it did. And I help people to see it very clearly and to, to then get into a place where you're connected to that little three-year-old self that first created that story and and wake yourself up from the trance. I am more than worthy of love, just as I am. I need do nothing to prove my value. That's the power statement for someone who's got an I'm not enough. Or for someone who has an I'm invisible story. I came here to be seen. And it's my responsibility to presence myself. 
right? These are the these are the core, almost like chiropractic adjustments of consciousness that need to be made moving forward so that you can trust yourself to not do this again. And that is liberating. That is life-altering, life-changing. Well, Catherine, in terms of that process, that experience, you mentioned the trauma that's often associated with breaking up and the expression, time heals all, and how perhaps that that's not exactly true and how people need to go through certain steps, do the work, because as you mentioned, it's very easy for people on the outside to say, you know what, come to the bar, come to the restaurant, let me introduce you to somebody. But how does someone heal while at the same time working on themselves through the steps that you just mentioned? Yeah, it's great. Great question. I mean, I'm not saying don't go to the bar with your friend. So you want to be stretching and putting yourself out there and taking care of your body, working out, just improving your life in any and all ways that you can in ways that are very self-nurturing. But it's almost like you want to put yourself into what my friend Lauren calls a romantic rehab, right? So you you say- I I love that. I I love that phrase because it's applicable after a breakup and what everybody goes through. Yeah. So you have to think of it as like, I, I'm at a in a time where I'm really in recovery right now. I need to be gentle with myself. And step two, I'm asking you to stop blaming other people, but I also need you to stop blaming yourself. Usually when we ask ourselves questions about how is what's my part in it, we go straight to shame, some version of what's wrong with me, or we'll go to a psychological explanation, which then has us be victimized by our upbringing. Well, my father didn't really love me in the way I needed to be loved, so I think I'm not lovable. And but that's there's no freedom there. So again, choices, behaviors, like what were we actually doing that actually contributed to this? So we're we're looking at a lot, high level of self-care, but I think that a, a big breakup really requires us to do these these inner th- these three steps, this inner work of holding and containing our experience, step one, learning how to transform those negative emotions into a force for positive change, giving up blaming anyone, step two, the other person, ourselves, and look to see our part clearly in a way we can make amends. And step three, really challenging the story that comes up. I'll tell people how you get the story about what that false that that false identity is, that sore fracture wound, is what are you making the breakup mean about you? And 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 it's right there. It's like on the tip of your tongue that somehow I'm not good enough, that I'm always going to be alone, that no one wants me no matter how hard I try. It's right there. So you have to really name that and ask yourself, how old is this part of me that, that first glommed onto this story? And what's really true about that? As an adult, like if my kid was sitting on my lap and saying, mommy, I'll always be alone forever. No one will ever love me. What would I say to that little girl? I'd say, honey, that's not true. I know, you know, we haven't had great skills in this area, but you know what? I'm going to learn how to do this better. I am committed to learning how to do this better because we didn't come here to be alone. We came here to love and be loved. It's our destiny to love. Like we would push back. So the first three steps of conscious uncoupling are all internal. Catherine, I, I've always said separation, divorce, breaking up, it's the true team sport. And I know you're in California and you have the, the dynasties with the Los Angeles Lakers and the UCLA Bruins. And, and, and to me, there needs to be a team of support for people going through the process. It's not just the attorneys. And you mentioned the difficulty that attorneys may face because there's so much to unpack from an emotional side, not just the legal side that I assist with, but the emotional side that people go through when there's a breakup, when there's a loss to not only get on the other side of it, but to go through the process, especially when there's children involved or money, but to get through that period and to balance the emotions with seeing the light on the other side. So I want to ask you who should be on the team to help people get through one of the most difficult and challenging times of their lives? Well, so I love this question. And first, can I just appreciate all of the attorneys who are kind of snapping on their red capes 
and really looking to do right by people and not capitalizing on the vulnerability of all the assets that are available to go through, which I, and I think attorneys have a pretty bad rap on this and divorce has become quite, quite an industry that's made a lot of people very wealthy. But I really get that there's people like you, Evan, who care deeply about people and want to do the right thing for the kids and all of that. And that's a certain trust in the overall goodness of life. And I just am really moved by by you guys. I think that people, though, come in and they do come in with all this animosity, all this anger, all of this terror and fear that makes them grasp at things. So the ideal is, is to have people that attorneys can recommend who are pretty on board with this more conscious way of doing things. And I know that some of the coaches that I've trained, the conscious uncoupling coaches, are kind of on the on speed dial of some of the attorney's phones because they call them and they say, would you work with this couple? Would you help them to go through the steps and calm them down so that we're making wise decisions that are setting everyone up to flourish in the aftermath of this separation? And, and also painting the, a, a picture, which is realistic, that there will be a period where everybody's standard of living dips for a time, and that then they can recover from that, that that's you're going from one household to two, that's normal, so just normalizing that. So getting a more balanced perspective on the, on the legal side of things is a great idea. I think that sometimes friends don't, you know, not meaning to, they will just kind of take sides automatically. So your best friends will say things like, well, I never liked him anyway, or I always thought she was just a user. And she was just money hungry. And so they start to villainize the other person. It's just kind of a, it's the unspoken good friend code. Or your your parents will do that and start getting on board with making that person wrong and going, you know, encouraging you to fight for what's yours. So most people who are well-meaning are not going to necessarily be able to steer you in the direction of a conscious uncoupling. They're not going to say, well, sweetheart, you did make those choices in the beginning where you knew you didn't really love him, but you were going for the security and probably he didn't feel loved by you and sought love elsewhere. So uh, most friends are not going to say that. So I think that uh, someone who is a conscious uncoupling coach, they're trained in this modality. It's a rigorous conversation, but it's a liberating conversation. It, what will free you is that high level of self-responsibility. Or if you say to your friends and your family, stay close to me and do me a favor and let's all really try and do this very consciously where we resist the pull to villainize the other person or to punish the other person. I actually have like almost a script in the book where it says, you know, how to tell your friends, I'm going to really strive to do this well. I think this is in, the, in my best interest. I think it's in the best interest of the children to do this well, even though my partner cheated, we're going to real look to do this holistically. This is the only father my children will ever have. And Catherine, yeah. I love the work that you're doing as a coach, as a teacher, training people on the method and the process that you describe so beautifully in the book. And I think having that support is so important. And I appreciate everything you said, because I think it's it, 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 for clients who are in my office going through this challenging, this upsetting time, the emotions are real. And as an attorney, I know that I can guide my clients from the legal side of it, but also put people in a position to work with experts, work with different people who understand what they're going through, but can help them get to the other side of it. So I think it's incredibly important. And really the steps in your book, Conscious Uncoupling, outline it for people in you know a way that makes sense to get people through this time in their lives. Catherine, I love hearing from the guests that come on the podcast, the impact of their own personal life experiences on the work that they do. And so as you look at your journey and your career, best-selling author, two phenomenal books, a marriage and family therapist, teacher, a coach, relationship expert, you've inspired so many people to divorce in a different, better way and to break up with a model in place that allows people to find happiness both in the short term and long term. So as you look back and, and reflect on this path and journey for you, what has been the impact of your personal experiences 
on how you help people move forward. This has been very close to my heart. And I think sometimes the biggest areas of wounding in our own life is where we end up making the biggest contribution. I'm the product of a very ugly, nasty divorce that that kind of lasted in its animosity for the whole of my childhood because my parents broke up when I was about two. And I, I, I really had a rocky road relationally in my 20s and my 30s. It wasn't until my 40s really that I started to sort myself out and I was able to create outside of the patterns that developed inside of the, the animosity between my parents and uh, and then and I wrote Calling in the One and it became uh, a, a national bestseller and I had thousands of students coming and then suddenly I we divorced after 10 years and it was kind of shocking. I didn't really see it coming, although certainly in hindsight, I could see all the signs that I missed along the way and all the things, all the mistakes that I made. And, and that became then the food for conscious uncoupling because the one saving grace is how elegantly and generously and kindly we did that and remained good on very good terms and really great co-parents together. So when I was able to, you know, create conscious uncoupling out of that, <clears throat> first of all, it repositioned this idea that the relationship failed because I had two major best-selling books from that relationship and a beautiful daughter and uh, a lifelong friend. So it's, I don't hold that relationship as a failure. I can see the mistakes that I made that I've now grown from because I'm now repartnered very happily and everything I learned from that relationship, I now implement here and thank goodness because it's such a, a healthy, loving connection that I have constantly with my, with my new partner. But I think it's to remind us all, we're all inside the happily ever after myth. And it kind of is the standard that we covertly hold ourselves and other people to. But that myth was created 400 years ago and the lifespan was less than 40 years of age. It's not, it's not statistically relevant any longer in our lives. So as we are updating our childcare practices and our educational practices and our diets and our exercise program, we actually really have to redo the map for relationship so that if and when they do end, we can do that with dignity and grace and in a way that is kind and conscious and really aligned with our values and our ethics more than just kind of taken over by our overwhelming emotions. So that's the offering of conscious uncoupling. And, and I know it's doing a lot of good in the world. So I'm beyond, beyond grateful. It's been unbelievably rewarding to have gone through such a, such a dramatic, dark journey in my childhood with this issue and then be able to pay it forward in this beautiful way. Catherine, that's such an incredible, you know, perspective, a really powerful story. So thank you for sharing that with us. I want to ask you, you mentioned how we could view a relationship or marriage. And are we at a place in 2021 where maybe it's not until death do, do us part? Are we at a place where we can look at a marriage, whether it's 10 years two kids or 50 something years and people are in their sixties and they, people are living longer and people just want more out of life. Are we now in a place as a society where we can look at marriage and view it as a success, even when it ends because of what took place during the time period people were together? That is my hope, Evan. The studies will show that serial monogamy is actually the norm. Much more than you meet one person, you mate with that person, you're together forever. So most of us, I think, statistically are said to have two or three very significant relationships in our lifetime. And that means one or two very significant breakups. And breakups are a crossroads, and they will define the future, how we do that. I always like to say your next relationship won't begin when you meet the next person, but with how you end with this one. So this whole thing about time will heal a broken heart, it's, it's not really accurate. If you think of if you broke your leg, you wouldn't just kind of let it stay broken and just say, well, time will heal 
this broken leg unless you didn't mind walking with a limp for the rest of your life. So this is the same with your heart. You have to really set things up so that that wound heals properly and you can become stronger in that place where your heart was once broken and learn your lessons. It's all about growing in wisdom and growing your capacity to love more deeply and in a, in a healthier way so that you're liberated on the other side of it. So steps four and five of the conscious uncoupling process, that's when you're dealing with your partner. Steps four is is becoming a love alchemist. So meaning replacing all of the kind of negative feelings now with hope, with restitution, with forgiveness, self-forgiveness, forgiveness of the other person. I talk about what actually creates forgiveness. I think a lot of times when we're trying to process pain with someone else, we we do things like explain why we did what we did. We explain our psychology or what happened to us in childhood. And that doesn't actually complete things. What completes things is really getting the other person's experience. And whether or not you agree with how that's landing for them, whether or not you think that they're being overly dramatic or that they should or shouldn't feel that way, you just get the other person's experience. You mirror it back to them and you look to make an amends. You can count on me from now on to always do this or not do that again in our relationship, or if you can't make it up directly with that person, just moving forward from this moment forward. I'll never treat another person like that. So that begins to restore integrity between the two of you. I talk about setting a new intention for the relationship to be great co-parents, or I'll always honor you as my dark guru, the person who brought up everything that was at love so I could learn about love. Thank you so much. And then, and then really setting up the structures in step five, which is, I think what we're hoping to do with the attorneys is creating your happy, even after life. Like an example of that is when I was with the mediator with my husband, Mark, he actually surprised both of us when he said that he didn't want any royalties from calling in the one. Now, I was married to Mark when I wrote that book, and he was entitled to 10% of the royalties on the book. And I think at the time I was making a few thousand dollars a year in royalties, and that would have been a few hundred dollars for him every year, and then in perpetuity as that grew. But he didn't want any of those royalties. And I was so touched by the generosity. He just said, Catherine worked really, really hard and they, and they really should go to her. And, and, and that generosity really kind of set the stage for really looking at things from this place where you trust life, you trust your ability to recreate life. It's more like you're going for what's fair, what's right, what's an integrity. And that's a that's a beautiful place to live life from. So of course, Mark is doing really well in life. And I'm not surprised that he's doing so well, because that level of generosity tends to be repaid. One of my favorite sayings, I think was started by Thoreau that you can't outgive God. And whatever your your version of that is, you can't outgive the universe that I think that that kind of uh, generous gesture that that really generates uh, a certain level of goodness and begins to build that the happy even after family in a healthy way is 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 richly rewarded so Catherine, I, lo- I love hearing that story and i would think as you think back to, to to that example that story what you went through and really the generosity as you describe w- w- with your ex-husband it could have been very different it could have been very different had he not exhibited that generosity, not only for that time period in terms of the royalties in the book. And, and I see that with, with, with clients that I work with in terms of the assets and, and people get very polarized in their positions and the conflict just, it, it becomes a domino and a snowball that just spirals. So I would think it could have been very differently for you had he not exhibited that generosity and had the relationship that not been in the place that you described. Well, and it came back to him a few weeks later, right? So he planted something. He actually is the start of conscious uncoupling. Like that, I, was, I was so moved by that generosity and his kindness in that moment. And a few weeks later, he lost his job. So he had just moved into this apartment. We're in that time where everything's tight because you're going from one home to two. 
and he loses his job. And when he called me, my first impulse was to comfort him and say, well, I'm sure you're going to find something soon. When I got off the phone, I thought, oh, my gosh, what about child support? Right. I went right into fear and I could have called him back because I had the impulse to do it. Like, hey, you have to still pay that child support. You're going to have to figure that out. I don't know how you're going to manage it, but you need to do that. And I wrestled with it. And I and I came to the the realization. I thought, you know, there's a lot of ways to earn money. And I'm fortunate that I'm somewhat entrepreneurial. And I thought you can probably replace that money. And it would it would be a great kindness to just call him and say, why don't you put child support on hold while you're looking for a job? Don't I want to take that stress off you? But the 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 realization I had, Evan, was I thought, you know. There's a there's a hundred ways for you to make more money, but there's only one father that your daughter will ever have. And so I I protected that relationship and I responded to his generosity to me with an act of generosity. And that's how we built it. It was kind of one generous gesture at a time, and it it just ended up creating this really lovely best case scenario, I think, between us in the aftermath of divorce. Catherine, hearing that and protecting the relationship, something so incredibly important when people separate and break up. And again, hearing your story, hearing the forming of the conscious uncoupling and the dynamic between you and your ex and everything that you went through, it's not only inspiring, but it shows people that it can be done with a simple act of kindness, generosity, and how those acts snowball into other acts, especially when there's children involved. Absolutely. And and just on the other side of it, it is well worth the effort. I see evidence of that in our relationship today and co-parenting. My daughter has, she's impacted by the pandemic and there's all sorts of stuff going on that's kind of interrupting her college years. And, and we talk about it and we're aligned and she can't play us off each other. And so we're a good team. So I see benefits there. I see benefits that we're both really flourishing in life. We're both in really happy relationships. I see evidence of the reward of those efforts in the relationship I have with my partner, Michael, that is so much richer in communication and the ability to, to resolve conflicts between us. There's such a uh, much deeper sense of partnership. When I look back and I saw I was doing that review with Mark, I realized I so felt alone in childhood that I kind of carried all that self-sufficiency into my relationship. And I didn't generate togetherness in that, in that relationship. And that's why we could kind of drift so far apart until it was irreparable. But so now I'm in a relationship with Michael and I, I bring myself to it all the time. I share, I generate partnership, I generate togetherness, I honor holidays, I honor the Sabbath. Like we just do things that create partnership, which I didn't know to do in my first marriage. So it's really a reflection of my efforts to do this conscious uncoupling work and to just take responsibility for my part. I wasn't wrong and bad. This was stuff I didn't know how to do, but I needed to learn it. I needed to see it clearly and get myself on the trajectory to figure that out so that I could create a very different relationship on the other side of it. And Catherine, you mentioned the work and the lessons learned in one relationship, taking that and applying it to a new relationship. And that's great to hear. And Catherine, again, for all the listeners, your books, Conscious Uncoupling, Five Steps to Living Happily Even After, and the new edition of Calling in the One seven weeks to attract the love of your life. I can't wait to get through the new edition of your book and tell the listeners, because you mentioned the work that you do as a coach with your conscious uncoupling trainings, tell all the listeners the exciting events and everything that you have coming up. Oh, thank you. Well, we have a lot happening, particularly around conscious uncoupling right now. We have a a uh, three-day event, Liberate Your Heart, in August that we're going to be announcing in just a couple of weeks. 
And I have a coach training this fall for conscious uncoupling for people who want to come in and learn how to do this and people from all walks of life. And it's so rewarding. Therapists and psychologists and realtors and attorneys, all sorts of people. You can do a lot of different things with conscious uncoupling, focus on practice with children, focus on working with attorneys, focusing on people who have just suffered a breakup and have a, a broken heart work with another coach to get a couple through together. So there's all sorts of stuff that our coaches are doing. And you can find a coach right on consciousuncoupling.com or find out about the training. Catherine, thank you for coming on the podcast. This was absolutely terrific. It was such a pleasure speaking with you and, and having you on the show. Thank you so much. What a show on the Shine On Podcast, episode number 21 in the books, the brilliant Catherine Woodward Thomas. Wow. Was she great? Her book, Conscious Uncoupling, this will change the way you think about the divorce process once and for all. Emails and comments, keep them coming in. We'll respond to all of them. The Shine on Podcast email address is evan at shineondivorce.com. To all the listeners, thank you for listening. You can find the podcast on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, and wherever else you listen to your podcast. You can follow me on social media. I'm everywhere. Check out all the episodes of the podcast on my website and read my latest blogs featuring our terrific podcast guest at shineofdivorce.com. I'm Evan Shine, and I'll talk to you again real soon.